Hashem El Sarag, I'm a professor of medicine right now and a chair of the Department of Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. So give us a little background on how you got into medicine and also how you chose gastroenterology. It's a long story. So I'm a Palestinian from Gaza. I grew up in Benghazi, Libya. I waited a long time for Benghazi, Libya to come on the news and it finally came and it wasn't good. But I grew up there and went to medical school and I wanted to be a surgeon. So I actually started my residency training there in Libya. And for a bunch of circumstances, I left Libya, went to Austria, Vienna. And my hope was to continue my surgical training either there or in England. It didn't work out. What worked out is I went to Newark, New Jersey for an internal medicine residency and I found gastroenterology and it was the closest thing to surgery that internal medicine can bring you. So I was interested in GI because I wanted to be an advanced endoscopy. I just like you know, cutting and probing and doing things like that. So I joined my fellowship training in, at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and my goal to be um, an advanced uh, gastroenterology, advanced endoscopy GI. There, I met a wonderful mentor, Amnon Sonnenberg, and he opened my eyes onto the world of epidemiology, uh, statistics, uh, programming. And uh, I added the research portfolio and a master's in public health, and uh, the rest is history. So I became a clinical investigator slash gastroenterologist. What would you tell someone who's considering a career in gastroenterology today? I think it's a, it's a wonderful career. Of course, I'm biased, uh, but it, it does combine uh, the cognitive aspects of medicine with the procedural parts. If people are into procedural parts, then it seems to be the sky is the limit with uh, third space endoscopy and things like that. Um, uh, so uh, plus, it's, it's really a fulfilling uh, field. Uh, as is medicine in general. Uh, so those who enjoy patient interactions, endoscopy, and intellectual curiosity, you got it. What motivated you to join the AGA board and eventually become the president? That's a good question. Um, so what I missed saying in my journey is, uh, I, I mentioned it in two to three lines, uh, but there have been many blocks and obstacles along the way. And I've been helped by people who remain anonymous to this point. I, I don't know who they are, but people who pushed you, gave you a letter, advised you, mentored you, gave you a visa, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, cumulatively, it led in me this sense of uh, finally giving back a concept of service. Perhaps I can't pay those people back specifically, but paying back to the larger community is what drove me uh, to eventually become uh, the AGA or apply for the AGA presidency. But why the AGA? Uh, I worked, I've been an AGA member since I was at, in training in the mid 90s, uh, joined some of the committees, liked the work, to became, get invited to talks, and then eventually I became an associate editor for gastroenterology and then an editor in chief for clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. There, really, I, I felt what the organization is about. I, I met the people. I interacted with them. I figured out what this organization is, the structure, the strategy, uh, and I fell in love with it, for lack of better words. So when the opportunity uh, presented itself, I uh, applied. Uh, I didn't want to be the president of any other society. It was the AGA that I chose uh, for those reasons. What do you recollect from your time as president? So um, I was a president for the year 2019-2020. Uh, and if you recall, uh, there, something happened in 2020 called COVID. Um, so what I recall is the first part of my presidency, it was full of beautiful trips going to Chicago, preparing for the DDW, I chose the Field Museum as the place to have the presidential dinner. We chose the three-part uh, uh, Chicago blues band to play in that and, and all of these things. And then just like the rest of the world, uh, we heard the news early 2020 
And in the AGA, we struggled initially, perhaps not justifiably, but we struggled whether we canceled the meeting or not. And I've learned that I had the distinct honor of canceling the first DDW uh, as far as memory can go. Uh, so that was a rough time, but a memorable time. On the positive side of it, and uh, we, we in the AGA, and I was a president at the time, uh, produced several important evidence-based guidelines uh, in a record short time. I mean, we're talking two to three weeks per guideline uh, about COVID and the practice of gastroenterology and when to do endoscopy and what kind of protections to do and do you open, do you close? Uh, so I, I look back with a sense of pride, uh, although combined with pain uh, during that time period. Now, leaving some of the, the COVID things behind, I like to think that we've done a few other things. So I think we pushed uh, the ball forward as far as working with the ABIM uh, to facilitate the recredentialing for gastroenterologists with minimum testing. We launched a new uh, journal um, and uh, we, uh, and, and that's really important. And I wanna pause here a little bit. The beauty about the AGA and why I like joining it is becoming an organization with a strategic plan that is a multi-year plan. And I wanted a place like this. I'm really not into launching my own initiatives every couple of weeks or so, which I find distracting. So I like the idea that this is an organization with a set direction, tactics and strategies. And my role is just to shepherd things along. Uh, so uh, that by its nature doesn't produce big aha moments because there is no Hashem El Sarag initiative on the AGA. I was just one of the presidents who moved the strategic plan of the AGA forward. What impact did leading AGA have on you personally? Uh, many, many, many things. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, the AGA presidency has affected me personally in, in several aspects. Uh, first, I, uh, it was a, a first-hand interaction uh, with an organization that values uh, planning, uh, strategy, tactics, and all of those uh, business-slash-leadership-slash-management lingo uh, outside a textbook, outside a course. Uh, so I've learned a lot from the AGA staff and governing board on how to discuss ideas, how to take ideas from just being an idea and put it down into concrete initiatives. I've also learned from the AGA that return on investment. So each time, uh, with time, each time we utter a new initiative, uh, you start thinking, is this worth it or not? What do you have to give up in order to do this? Uh, so that's on the business part of it. But what the AGA presidency left me with is, uh, everlasting relationships and friendships with members of the governing board and with the AGA staff. And, and these are uh, things that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. On a personal basis, I was told at least that I'm the first uh, Middle Eastern, I'm certainly the first Palestinian AGA president. I'm the 114th president. And I cannot help that I have this tremendous sense of pride in leading arguably the world's greatest organization in gastroenterology uh, for one year. And uh, I think I'll pass this uh, you know, to, to my children and my grandchildren. What are your thoughts on where AGA is today? I, I think the AGA is uh, in a great place, uh, but in an uncertain place like many organizations uh, around us. Um, it's uh, financially robust, has a strong strategic plan, has dynamic leadership, uh, and has uh, th uh, thriving uh, committees uh, that are replenished by our younger generations of gastroenterologists. It caters quite well uh, to the science, the education, and clinical practice. Uh, so um, any gastroenterologist should find something they like in it. Um, so I'm optimistic about the future, and the source of my optimism is, is the people. Do you have any specific hopes for AGA in the future? Um, uh, I'm, I'm a highly ambitious guy. I wish the AGA would rule the world. But uh, short of that, 
uh, I think, uh, to affirm their position as the world's leading organization for our society or, or our profession. Um, my hopes is um, there's a fourth revolution, which is a post-technology revolution. It's, it's taking all those technological advances and putting them into the realm of business. And uh, we're at the intersection of that. And my hope is the AGA uh, would place itself in a position to take advantage of all of these fantastic discoveries and somehow push them uh, to the benefit of the field. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to share that I didn't ask you about? Um, so uh, part of the effects of the AGA on me as a person and what I hope my legacy would be, uh, my legacy I hope would be to inspire people uh, and to say if someone like this can become the AGA president, then I also can do it. Um, uh, so the, the ability uh, to grow within the system, uh, to work your way up, and to eventually lead an organization, uh, I don't think one can take that for granted. And it does speak a lot about the organization, perhaps more than what it speaks about the individual. So I hope I would leave that uh, inspiration behind me.